much for a splendid introduction. I'm delighted to be here. I have to confess right off that uh, this is the very first time I've ever been in this wonderful country or this incredibly historic city. I'm here for much too short a time. I arrived at 5 o'clock this morning, and I'm leaving tomorrow uh, morning. Um, but the next time I come, I'm convinced that I'll make sure I stay uh, longer. So my plan in talking about the topic of Beyond Kyoto, providing you with a, an economic perspective on climate change policy, my plan is to be very brief, to maximize time essentially for you know, discussion and interaction. And actually, I'm going to start because I, I recognize that not all of you are economists, and some of you might be wondering, you know, what the heck does an economist have to say about a scientific problem such as climate change policy? So I want to start by telling you a story, uh, and that is uh, I was getting on an airplane a while back, and I sat down in my seat, and the gentleman next to me clearly wanted to have a conversation. Maybe you've noticed what I have, and that there are two kinds of people that fly, those who like to talk to perfect strangers, and then the rest of us. <laughs> So I'm very much in that second category. I don't like to have conversations on planes. In fact, my wife would probably say if she were here, I don't like to have conversations in general. Um, so I often carry a book, some kind of defensive material to prevent the conversation from taking place. But what he did is he started out the conversation the way Americans anyway do. Uh, he said, well, what business are you in? And I did something that was quite foolish. I told the truth. <laughs> and I said, I'm an environmental economist. And he looked at me. And I looked at him. And he didn't say anything further. And here is this fellow who clearly wanted to chat, wanted to have a conversation, yet he wasn't following up with anything else. And as I looked into his eyes, and he essentially looked into mine, it, it occurred to me that the reason he wasn't saying anything further is that he had concluded that he had just met a living, breathing oxymoron, <laughs> an internal contradiction, because it's either economics or the environment. It's either the economy or the environment. So this very phrase, even, of environmental economics made absolutely no sense to him. So part of my purpose is at least to assert to you, if not to demonstrate, that environmental economics is not oxymoronic. It is far from it. And the reason is as follows. It's two parts. One is that the causes of environmental problems in a market economy, as we have now virtually in all countries of the world, with the exception of a handful, that the causes are economic. It's the consequence of unintentional byproducts of activities or what economists call externalities. And secondly, the consequences of environmental problems have very important economic dimensions. So surely if the causes are economic and there are important economic consequences, then an economic perspective, economic analysis, if you will, can be very important to really understand the problems in a way that we will be able to design solutions that are effective, that are economically sensible, and because they're economically sensible, stand a chance of being politically pragmatic and practical. So with that as a basis, I'm going to turn to looking at the basic economics of the climate change phenomenon which ties in with certainly where so much of the expertise of this institution lies, and that's the geopolitics of climate change. Because the basic reality of climate change that, of course, differentiates it from all other environmental problems except one, stratospheric ozone depletion, the key characteristic of it is that it is a global commons problem, that greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases that lead to, their, their concentrations lead to climate change, those greenhouse gases uniformly mix in the atmosphere, and it doesn't matter where the gases came from. If they come from New York or Dublin or Beijing, they're still going to have the same effect. 
That turns out to be extremely important economically and therefore politically because that means that any jurisdiction that decides to take action, whether it's a region of the world, it's a single nation, it's a state or province, or it's a, a city, is going to incur the cost of its actions. But the benefits of its actions are going to be spread globally. And that means it is inevitably the case that for virtually any jurisdiction you can name, except the world as a whole, the benefits of taking action are going to be less than the costs of taking action. And that's, of course, the classic free rider problem. And it means it's therefore in the selfish interest of each and every country to let the others go ahead. Now, that means that international cooperation is needed, that unlike dealing with all the other environmental problems virtually that you could think of, where there are different types of air pollution, even transboundary problems like acid rain, which move from country to country, water pollution, unlike any of those problems, leaving it up to individual nations to take action on their own is unlikely to be sufficient, that international cooperation of some kind is required. And note I say international, I put in italics, not necessarily global, and that's just because of mathematically what the numbers are, as, as you'll see. This is also why the highest levels of effective government should be involved. Now, in most parts of the world, that means sovereign states, that means nations. Europe's an exception to that because of the existence of the European Union, which then becomes the appropriate body to be participating in the cooperation because it is a higher level of aggregation. But it's national action that's necessary to fulfill whatever international cooperation decides. So I'm going to start by saying a few words about an economic perspective on national climate policy action, and then I'll go to international cooperation and spend most of my time there, taking us right up to the negotiations that are forthcoming in December in Durban, South Africa. Now, most economists and other policy analysts favor carbon pricing, which might be a carbon tax, it might be a cap and trade system. So carbon pricing is a generic phrase, meaning placing a shadow price on carbon dioxide, essentially. And why is it that there's all this support from the analytical community, anyway? It's not for ideological purposes. It's not because economists think markets are cool. It's for a set of very practical reasons. The first one is that there is no other feasible approach that can provide truly meaningful emissions reductions because of the pervasiveness in a modern economy of energy generation and use. It means that if we were trying to regulate through a conventional means with performance standards or technology standards, we would be trying to regulate hundreds of millions of individual sources, you know, every factory, every store, every home, every car, every motorcycle, every lawnmower, every barbecue grill, on and on and on. Completely impossible to do through technology standards or through uniform performance standards of any kind. Now when I, I say it's for a truly meaningful emission reduction, what is a truly a meaningful emission reduction? Well, you could take the Europeans uh, 2020 targets or beyond. In the context of the U.S., which is what I'm going to comment on, I'd say that meaningful targets would be what is the official target, aspirational target, obviously not legal mandate, of the United States, of the current administration, which is an 80 percent cut in national CO2 emissions below the uh, 2005 level by 2050. Secondly, it's the least costly approach in the short term. The reason why carbon pricing is the least costly approach in the short term is that by placing a shadow price on carbon, it provides an incentive for every source to wind up controlling at the same incremental cost, or as economists call it, the same marginal cost. That's very important because the costs vary tremendously across sources, not by a factor of two to one, but by a factor of 10,000 to one. So a uniform standard will turn out to be hideously costly because 
for cost effectiveness, you want those sources who can control cheaply to do a lot, those sources who can, it's very costly, you want them to do less. And the costs are very heterogeneous. Thirdly, in terms of the long term, it's clear that for the very ambitious targets that are necessary, that will be necessary, massive amounts of technological change are going to be required. I'm not talking about diffusion of existing technologies, but invention and innovation or commercialization of new ones. And for that, price signals will be required. It's, again, impossible to picture it otherwise happening. So for these reasons, I would say that, and I think most econom all economists and most policy analysts would say that carbon pricing is a necessary component of a sensible climate policy. I put in parenthesis that it's necessary but not sufficient, and, and I'll explain why in a moment, why it's not sufficient. But carbon pricing, to turn to politics, is a very controversial issue, particularly in my own country, but in many other parts of the world. We've seen the debates uh, that uh, are currently taking place in Australia would be a good example of that contemporaneously. <laughs> And the reason is that it makes the cost transparent. These technology standards are very good at hiding the costs. If you walk down the street in, in Dublin and you ask people how much fuel efficiency standards that place mandates on automobiles that require them to use lighter materials, in effect, or require them to use more efficient engines, how much it costs them in terms of the price of a car, they'll say, I don't know, I don't think it costs anything, because when I see the sticker in the showroom, it doesn't say anything about that, that, that that's free. So it's very easy to put those in, in place. On the other hand, if you talk about doubling the price of gasoline, even though that would be more effective, everyone knows that price. So because of the fact that the costs are transparent, which is positive from an economic perspective, it makes it very, very difficult politically. Indeed, in the United States, the notion of cap and trade, the mechanism that is used in Europe under the emissions trading scheme, uh, was denigrated as cap and tax and successfully demonized, actually, that way. So for political reasons in the US, what I've characterized as a meaningful national uh, economy-wide carbon pricing policy is very unlikely to be enacted before 2013, and, and that's at the very earliest, and I won't take time to go through what would be the political chips that would have to fall in place for it to even happen in 2013, but if you want to talk about it later, we can. So does that mean there will be no U.S. climate policy? No, it, it doesn't mean that, and I think this is something that's not sufficiently understood the further one moves away, perhaps, from the U.S. There are some other important climate policy developments that are taking place. Um, the first of all is the ongoing recession. There is a increased interest uh, because of the recession and because of the fiscal realities of budgetary deficits, of new, looking for new sources of revenue. Right now, that's a polarized debate of Democrats versus Republicans. But it's considered quite possible that there will be a new look at consumption taxes, which might be more favorably viewed than income taxes. And if one looks at consumption taxes, a natural thing to look at are energy taxes. Energy taxes are not exactly a carbon tax, but they're a step of the direction. They're one step in that direction. Secondly, there was the stimulus package in the U.S. I'm not talking about the new proposal from the president, but the one that came in um, at the very beginning of the Obama administration. And within that $890 billion package was $80 billion um, that was committed for renewables and energy efficiency. Now, on the other hand, the delays uh, there have been massive delays in, in getting that out. There are also new uh, fuel efficiency standards for automobiles, which are going out to 2035, which are extremely important. If I, I didn't put graphs in this presentation, but if you saw the graph, you'd see how it lowers tremendously the trajectory of emissions increases. There are also uh, other kinds of energy policies that uh, are not targeted CO2, but nevertheless reduce CO2. There's a lot of interest in a so-called national renewable electricity standard, even more in a clean energy standard. Um, I'm not going to define these, but if you want to talk about them, we can. And then technology policies. So this is where we get to the necessary but not sufficient. Um, the reason is that even if you get the prices right uh, with a carbon tax or a cap and trade system, there, a big problem remains in this domain. And it has to do with research and development, which is very important because of needing long-term technological change. And that is 
that when you carry out R&D in your firm, basic R&D at your company, you pay the costs of it, but you don't get all the benefits, right? So Apple did all the basic R&D of, of the iPhone, but a lot of you in this room have a smartphone that's, that's, that is made by a different company. I've got a BlackBerry smartphone. The Storm 2 looks just like the iPhone, but Apple's not getting the money. So what happened was a knowledge spillover because information is, in the words of economics, a phrase of economics, a public good. So that means when you carry out basic R&D, you get all the uh, costs, but you don't get all the benefits. Even with a perfect system of intellectual property rights, even with patents that are perfectly enforced, there's tremendous evidence, 50 years of economic research, of the knowledge spillover from patents legally, let alone illegally, in the world. So that means that an insufficient amount of R&D would be incentivized by an appropriate carbon tax or cap and trade system, by the price signals alone, and something additional is needed. That could take the form of government subsidies. Better yet, from my perspective, it would take the form of government-funded R&D, uh, perhaps in universities and think tanks and the like, a lot on the engineering, not necessarily the economics. So technology policy is another part of it. There are also other federal regulations that are actually in place or on the way in the U.S. There is, as you may know, a Supreme Court decision on climate change. The administration issued a finding which triggered the Clean Air Act. Uh, it's already affected mobile sources. The stationary store standards are now in process. Um, there are delays. There are intentional delays by the administration because of the recession, which is not necessarily unwise to slow down uh, and regulations for what is a long-term problem when you have a short-term uh, negative downturn in the business cycle. Uh, and then there are air pollution uh, regulations, uh, five of them uh, uh, are the important ones, for other pollutants that have nothing to do with CO2, it doesn't name CO2, and yet they have profound effects on CO2 because they're correlated with CO2. And those are for SOx, NOx, mercury, particulates, coal ash, and cooling water. And these will have huge effects on investment in new coal, retirement of existing coal, and dispatch of coal versus natural gas. So let me skip, because of time, some of the other things. Instead, go right to um, the international domain. So that's the pace of what's happening in the US. Europe is obviously vastly uh, further ahead. New Zealand is uh, further ahead. Australia is now, as you know, in process of moving forward. Canada is sort of sticking with the United States, and Japan has uh, slow down but is moving, but the international discussions are key because it's a global commons problem. So I want to place the climate negotiations in perspective. And, you know, we're now finishing up uh, the American baseball season. Um, there's a cliche, and when a team, I, I suspect that you hear the same cliche with football in Europe, and that is when some team has lost its first four games and the reporters go into the locker room, at least in the case of baseball, see it's a very long season. It's 162 games. So when they've lost the first five or 10, the players say, don't worry about it. This is a marathon, not a sprint. They're right. That's even more true of climate change policy. It is a marathon, not a sprint. It is important to focus on the long term, not what's accomplished in the next six months or the next year or even the next five years. Why? Scientifically, first of all, it's a stock, not a flow environmental problem. It's the accumulated gas, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the concentrations that matter, and they have a very long lag time, decades to centuries, depending on the gases of leaving the atmosphere and essentially going into the oceans. Then economically, the cost-effective path from any analysis I've seen except one, so I've seen maybe 150, 200 economic analyses from both sides of the Atlantic Ocean and both sides of the Pacific, and all but one would say that the cost-effective path is a gradual ramp up of target severity because it's a long-term problem and we want to avoid unnecessary capital stock obsolescence. I'm not going to confiscate your, I don't want a policy that confiscates your car and tears down your house and tears down that coal-fired power plant tomorrow. What I do want is to provide you incentives or laws and regulations, if you prefer it with command and control, that the next time you buy a car, you move in the right 
direction, that the next time the factory is rebuilt, you move in the right direction, that the next time a power plant is built, it moves in the right direction, rather than rendering the capital stock obsolete unnecessarily for what is a long-term problem. And then economically, I said technological change is key. That is a long-term uh, phenomenon. And finally, administratively, what many of you know better than I do, is that the creation of durable international institutions is essential. This is a problem that is certainly as challenging because of the global commons nature of it as the reconstruction of Europe and trying to put together a sensible international monetary system following World War II. And when the people sat down in Bretton Woods at the end of war, after World War II, they had some short-term goals. But think about how long it took to build up the institutions eventually leading to the World Trade Organization just in that one dimension of it in trade. And here the same applies. New institutions will be required. That's going to be essential. So for all those reasons, I see the international climate negotiations as an ongoing process, much like trade talks are an ongoing process. No one says, well, in the next round, are we going to solve all trade problems forever? Of course not. It's an ongoing negotiation. Climate change will be the same way. That doesn't mean we should sit back and relax, but it does mean not to focus on a particular negotiation as solving the problem or, or not. Indeed, the sensible goal for negotiations is progress on a sound foundation for meaningful action in the long term, not a quest after an immediate solution, which is I've been saying for years. So with that, what actually happened then at the most recent international negotiations, which were in Cancun, Mexico, in December of 2010? Now some of you, how many of you were there with me? Okay, so then were you also in Copenhagen the year before? Oh, good. So I think that you'll agree that uh, with this, that the first thing we can say is that there is organizational success in Cancun and consensus with it was achieved. Uh, both contrast tremendously with Copenhagen. Uh, Copenhagen, the one great thing about having gone to the conference, COP15, in December of 2009 in Copenhagen, was that whenever I go to a conference of any kind for the rest of my life, it will never be the worst organized one. <laughs> so it's, it's good, it, that helps with some perspective. Cancun, as I'm gonna comment on at the end when I give credit to the Mexicans, in particular people in the foreign ministry, uh, it was brilliantly organized. Now, partly because they had just seen the disaster in Copenhagen and they knew exactly what to do in some cases to improve it. But there was organizational success and there was consensus achieved. In fact, there was consensus achieved on something called the Cancun Agreements, which unlike the agreement or the accord which came out of Copenhagen, that was two, two to four pages long. This is 32 pages long. So it's, it's, and it puts some meat on what had been done in Copenhagen to some degree. The first thing is that it includes emission targets and actions at this point for more than 80 countries. Uh, most of these, these targets and actions were submitted as part of a process initiated by the Copenhagen Accord, actually. Importantly, all the major economies are included. This is extremely important because if you're not a climate change aficionado, you may not realize that the way international climate policy operates is that a list that was put together at the time of the signing of the Kyoto Protocol. The list that was put together classifies countries as either having responsibilities that are quite serious or having no responsibilities whatsoever. The Annex I countries, which are pretty close to being the OECD countries, but not exactly, uh, have responsibilities, targets and timetables. The non-Annex I countries, which people used to call the developing world, don't have responsibilities. Of those countries that are non-Annex I and have no responsibilities, 55, 55 of them have higher per capita income than the poorest of the Annex I countries. Okay? So even if that list was appropriate then, which it was not because of the structure, it's wholly out of date. So this distinction that is within the Kyoto Protocol, the existing international agreement of the Annex I, non-Annex I distinction, th this is to me an anchor that is dragging on the floor of the ocean that is stopping progress of a ship of, of clim international climate policy progress. That's the anchor. And what the Cancun agreements do is that they blur that distinction. Unfortunately, they don't, don't eliminate it, as we'll see at the end, but they blur it. That was significant. Secondly, they establish mechanisms for monitoring and verification, even 
in a certain way in the key developing countries, in particular China, this was a huge point of uh, contention. Third, a green climate fund was established, although whether or not this is actually uh, financed is going to depend upon the individual countries to put up the money. And the U.S. at this point, because of domestic politics combined with the recession, combined with budgetary deficits, is not about to contribute significant amounts to that. Fourth, some initiatives on one small but uh, important part of the story, which is uh, deforestation, tropical deforestation. Uh, some advances were made. And then a structure was established for beginning to develop, just a structure, uh, some technology transfer issues. So is that a success? Because I didn't say much about emissions actually being reduced. So in order to say whether it was a success, let me summarize what I wrote and published before Cancun when I said what, it, what would be a success in Cancun, since reporters were calling regularly and saying, how will we know if it succeeds? And this is what I said at the time. Number one is that there are several processes that are going on in addition uh, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the official UN process that I've been describing. There's also called, something called the Major Economies Forum, which consists of a small set of countries, essentially uh, the OECD countries plus the large, largest non-OECD countries, so China, uh, uh, India, Brazil, Russia, the BRIC countries, and then a few others. This small set of countries, approximately 20 if we count the EU as one, account for 85% of emissions. Okay. Getting an agreement among 20 parties is a lot easier than getting agreement among 194 parties. So that's the major economies forum. It has a problem. The problem is that it was, it was founded and is chaired by the United States, by a single country and a country that's not held in high regard in terms of international climate policy. So another uh, uh, parallel process is the G20, which has actually addressed climate change, although this is the finance ministers, and they've got a lot else on their plate, obviously, now. And then finally, the C30, which is essentially the G20, throwing in some of the countries that would suffer most from climate change. And these are countries in the developing world, including in sub-Saharan Africa. So the first thing would be, I said, would be to embrace those parallel processes as input rather than viewing them as, in my opinion, the previous leadership uh, at, the, uh, at the time of Copenhagen of the UNFCCC did, viewed those as competition and denigrated them. And, and instead, I said they should be embraced. Number two was to consolidate tracks. So the, the negotiations in uh, going into Cancun, there were two official tracks within the international negotiations. One is negotiations over a second commitment period for the Kyoto Protocol, the first commitment period comes to an end at the end of 2012. The other is for long-term cooperative action, LCA, and that's for sort of a post-Kyoto, if you will, new kind of architecture, perhaps. So there are those two tracks. And then there was this Copenhagen Accord that was coming in from the previous negotiations. And I said if you could consolidate the three to two, in particular to take the Copenhagen Accord, which has some positive aspects to it, and make that the core of the long-term agreement discussions. Third, to focus on some productive steps within some specific narrow agreements, such as deforestation. And then fourth, just in general, to develop sensible expectations and therefore effective plans, instead of thinking that everything was going to be solved. All of that happened in Cancun. All of that happened in Cancun. And it's for that reason that I would call COP16 in Cancun last uh, December uh, a success. I'm not going to say it was an extremely important step forward. It was a modest step forward, but it was a meaningful step forward on this long-term problem. Now, why did Cancun succeed? So here we get to, I think, some specifics about the individuals and the situations. First of all, the Mexican government, as I said, through very careful planning, I was involved, lots of others I'm sure in this room were in Mexico City in the year leading up to it, working with the various ministries. They were very well prepared and they were extremely skillful in presiding over the talks. You'll recall that in Copenhagen, for those of you who are there, Danish Prime Minister Lars Locke Rasmussen, not the other Rasmussen who's now running NATO, the previous Prime Minister, 
but this one, who is apparently about to be the previous prime, uh, <laughs> prime minister, Rasmussen, also, um, at the end, in, you know, I hate to say this, but I mean, it, it can only be said, in, in demonstrating remarkable incompetence in running a meeting, I don't know what else to say, that he allowed the objections of five very unimportant countries, Bolivia, Cuba, Nicaragua, Sudan, and Venezuela, to completely derail the talks and to fail to reach an official agreement. In Cancun, the same thing happened from some of the same countries. Mexican Minister of Foreign Affairs, Patricia Espinoza, took note of the objections. She stated from the chair, consensus, which is what this process operates under, does not mean unanimity, bang the gavel, the Cancun agreements are adopted, everyone stood up and applauded except for a few countries. She knew how to run a meeting. Secondly, leading up to that, the two most important countries in all of this are, of course, China and U.S., the two largest emitters. And they set a tone of civility for the conference. It was not new for the U.S. The U.S. had already been more or less civil, even if they weren't agreeable. China was, was, had been less so, but this really changed in Cancun. In fact, someone I was talking with a lot there described uh, the Chinese as being on a charm offensive. There was also pressure from developing countries because developing countries were worried that if there was failure in Cancun after the perception of failure in Copenhagen, that that would cause demise of this UN process itself. And the developing countries love the UN process because majority rules in the General Assembly, right? So they've got a majority there. And the current structure in this process is the Kyoto Protocol in which they have no responsibilities. So they want, don't want this process to come apart. And then finally, I think we have to give credit to what's changed at the UNFCCC. I won't name the previous leadership, but the new leadership who presided for the first time she did over Cancun. Um, she was from Costa Rica, Cristiana Figueres, um, who has her feet in both worlds. She's from Costa Rica, has been a minister there. She spent much of her life in Washington, D.C., partly as a diplomat. And the result is she has credibility in both worlds, the industrialized world and the developing world. And she recognized that realism should eclipse idealism and that incremental steps in the right direction are probably going to be better than acrimonious debates over what are fundamentally unachievable targets, which is what we had been doing to some degree. So finally, the path ahead. Where does this take us to and what is uh, likely to be forthcoming? So the next international conference, the 17th conference of the parties, will be in Durban, South Africa in uh, December of this year. Uh, the first thing will be to define the institutions and the rules that are in the Cancun agreements to continue to put flesh onto it, although we have to admit that there's been some backtracking uh, by the Chinese in particular uh, in intermediary meetings, particularly in Bangkok a few months ago. So that looks, one could be less optimistic about that than one could before. But even more important is that in addition to the discussions uh, on the LCA track, the long-term cooperative action track, there is the Kyoto Protocol track still remains. And the decision on a second commitment period has been punted and punted and punted from one conference to another. And they can't put it off any longer because it's going to come to an end at the end of 2012. So it's now going to fall on everyone's lap in Durban. Keeping the Kyoto Protocol going, as, as I think I've uh, explained, is extremely important to uh, developing countries, or the, let me instead phrase it, the non-Annex I countries. I mean, it includes Singapore, which is richer than any of the countries that I've been in lately. Um, so it's not developing countries, it's the non-Annex I. But there's a big question, can, can there be a second commitment period for the Kyoto Protocol? The U.S. is, is not going to participate. That, the U.S. has stated that and obviously has not even ratified the Kyoto Protocol. Japan, Russia, and Canada have all now officially announced, Canada only uh, four, three or four months ago, have announced that they will not participate, will not support a second commitment period. A Australia, despite what is taking place now in terms of trying to put in place a carbon pricing regime, I think is very unlikely to take on targets in a second commitment period. So the question then is, is Europe, and I guess I should say Europe and New Zealand, um, is Europe on its own uh, credible or feasible? That's a decision for Europe to make, not only for the EU, but for the member states uh, to make. Whenever I've been in Brussels and I've met with people from private industry, I've always noticed that they are the greatest enthusiasts in the world for climate policy action in the United States and in countries outside of Europe, because they're very worried about the sucking sound uh, harming international competitiveness. 
Europe went first, thinking that they were going to bring others along. That obviously hasn't happened, and that's a serious issue for Europe to uh, grapple with. So for this reason, I say that Durban is probably going to be dominated not by what might be constructive discussions on the LCA track, the Cancun Agreement, and putting some flesh on that and moving forward, but rather on the contentious issue of a second commitment period for the Kyoto Protocol. And it's for that reason that I would say that uh, despite the weather, um, Durban may turn out to resemble Copenhagen more than it resembles Cancun, um, which is why I'm not sure if I'm going to go. So. <laughs> Uh, I've gone through a lot of material quickly. If you want more information that doesn't come up in our discussion, uh, here are some web addresses. The Harvard Project on Climate Agreements. We bring together uh, 46 research teams from Europe, the United States, China, India, Japan, and Australia working on climate, international climate agreement issues. The Harvard Environmental Economics Program, which is 25 professors at Harvard across the university. I direct that, working on all sorts of e issues. And then, um, as Frank Convery, I bet he could say the same thing. Like every academic, uh, everything that I've ever written since I was in kindergarten is available as a PDF file at my, at my own website. So thank you very much.